we all speak a different language. And we in some ways have different value systems too. So that is part of the challenge. And what I think we all recognize is to affect change, we need all those elements. That technology alone won't do it. Um, and policy alone, without having some way to inform policy, isn't useful either. So we would like to be the first university that comes to mind when Congress is debating some transportation policy issue. The goal is to bring visibility to MIT first and foremost, and to um, bring together the former students and the faculty and staff here to celebrate MIT's great history and, uh, and to think about our future. I was born in West Point, New York, and I grew up in a small town called Barrie in Vermont. Um, I have one sister and one brother, and um, I, we lived in Barrie up until the time I went off to college. And um, both my siblings and I, all of us, went to the University of Vermont as undergrads. Both of my parents, probably daily, um, said things like, you can do whatever you want if you're willing to work hard. And that just sort of stuck. And um, I think what I did was I sort of followed my interests and worked hard at them. And I liked math uh, when I was in school a lot. And that's how I followed that path of math and, and then engineering. Well, there were a few reasons. One, of course, it was known. I grew up in Vermont. Um, and I think it was maybe more why I didn't pick other places that's relevant. Um, my sister is one year older than I am. My brother's one year younger. So my parents had three of us in college at the same time. And so for financial reasons, primarily, I ended up going to the state school in, you know, at home. When I started at the University of Vermont, I was undecided. So I was, um, I was thinking about being a math major or an engineering major. And uh, I think, again, what drove me uh, to engineering was, in large part, financial considerations. So everybody says, do engineering, you can get a job. And so that was, I think, a big motivation for me to check it out. I mean, what they told me was, engineering is about math. So if you love math, you should also love engineering. I went through a few different engineering uh, disciplines before I found the one that, that matched me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I blew up a few ammeters in labs and things like that. But I found that, um, that I actually didn't fit really nicely into any of the traditional disciplines in engineering. Um, I did get my degree in civil engineering, but I was different even as an undergrad in terms of my interests. I already at that time started migrating to operations research, which I think is um, I was attracted to because it melds together math and computer science and engineering problem solving. And I liked the fact that um, it required some creativity to think about how you approach uh, the problems, how you model them with operations research. And I didn't find that element in all of the engineering disciplines, all of the subjects I was taking. I found sometimes they were kind of, I wanted to have more of a, um, an element of uncertainty in it. Like there is perhaps no right answer. Um, so I like that uncertainty and kind of messiness, but I also like the rigor and structure of math. So that's where I found operations research to be something I really enjoyed. I worked for a year and a half helping. Um, I was part of uh, Bechtel in Washington, D.C., and they were the construction managers for the metro at that time. And so I was the A, planning and scheduling engineer. Uh, which was fun, but I didn't see myself spending a career doing that. 
and so I knew I needed to go to graduate school. I wanted either to come to MIT or go to Stanford or Berkeley, and um, it turned out that I ended up applying only to MIT because um, I was newly married and my husband had a job offer in Boston, and so I came here. There were a number of different impressions. Um, first, um, I remember probably on my first day meeting a student who had just defended his doctoral dissertation, and he was now a PhD, a, prof a doctor. It's amazing, the students who are here and the quality of education one can get and to actually succeed uh, and complete the degree is I, I found really impressive. Um, I also I, I was amazed in meeting the students who were from all over the world, um, how interesting they were and how smart they were. Um, at times I thought, well this is kind of a weird place. When you walk through the basement halls, of course, that's where my office was, at all hours of the day and night, you know, there are people walking around. And so sometimes it does feel a little, you've entered a different world. And that was, um, that was one of my first observations, that, that sometimes it could be a bit strange around here. Uh, and then I guess other impressions as as I went along were, the, the, the impression I've had many students of mine tell me since, and that is, I think you've made a mistake. You, I, you know, I shouldn't have been admitted. And it, it's interesting because I remember feeling that, and so many of my students have said it to me since. And it's part of the process, it seems. You just have to find your way and you know, regain your confidence. Um, but initially it can be uh, pretty daunting. I found that the students here provided me this really incredible community. So we would, we would every day sit and work together on problem sets. Something that the faculty encourage because they, they know that learning comes by interacting with each other. And we'd have these really exhilarating debates, and it was really fun, and you, I just learned so much from, because what you learned usually was, we often were both right, that you could prove what, you were, what we were trying to do either way, but it, we were both doing it in different ways. And so you learned how to think a little bit differently, uh, and then sometimes you just learn that you were just wrong and your fellow students had something to teach you. So, uh, yeah, once I was here, I never thought about um, switching to a different school. Um, I think my focus on transportation was something that was um, started as an undergrad. So I was in civil and environmental engineering, and as I said, I, some of the subjects I had, maybe in structural engineering, or I don't want to offend anyone, but it just didn't do it for me. I, I didn't find what I was looking for. But when I took transportation subjects, I found that there was the element of, hmm, how does one solve this problem? There is no answer. so. There are different ways you can approach it and different trade-offs, and you have to make these design decisions. So I like that element of design. So I first got into that as an undergrad, then working for Bechtel was involved more in transportation systems, and so it was kind of a natural thing to follow up on here. I like things that don't have a right or wrong answer, but I I also like things that are amenable to rigorous structured mathematics. One of the faculty that I met quite early on here um, was Professor Amadeo Odoni, and uh, he gave me 
wonderful advice as a student and encouragement. He was the editor-in-chief of Transportation Science, the journal that is kind of the premier journal in, in my field. And so he helped tremendously with my how to write papers, how to get them through the review process. And then when I uh, joined the faculty here, at, faculty here at MIT, I was uh, actually assigned a mentor, uh, or they were in the process of assigning me a mentor. And I asked if I could instead have Amadeo Odoni. So they said, of course. And he's just been amazing. He's, uh, He's an incredibly insightful, uh, dedicated man, and uh, he's, it's been really wonderful to have him to turn to for advice. Mentors serve different roles for different people. Um, so if I step back a little bit, I, um, when I finished my PhD, I worked for four years as an assistant professor at Georgia Tech. And at Georgia Tech, I, I also had mentors, wonderful mentors. And I remember one of them saying to me one day, I don't know why I keep giving you advice. You never take it. And he was right. I, I'm not good at taking advice, but I do seek advice because I like, I like to hear how, how they think about whatever question I'm pondering. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'll follow it, or uh, that I agree, but I like to hear how others would think about it. Uh, so I think that that's how I use mentors. It's more to um, make sure I'm not missing some things as I think about it, uh, think about whatever it is I'm thinking about. Um, and, then I, and then I make my own decision about what's right for me, because I, I mean, what I tell my students um, or junior faculty who I am serving as a mentor, I, I give them my opinion and then I say, but my advice is to ignore most advice you get. Because I really think that if what you do is follow what's right for others, it, if it's not right for you, it's not going to work. So you really have to sort through that advice and figure out what is, what is it that works for you? Because everybody has different uh, priorities in their life, different things going on in their life. And so different solutions uh, fit for different people. So when I finished MIT, um, I took the position at Georgia Tech. And uh, it you know, was in their School of Industrial and Systems Engineering. Uh, that is where their operations research faculty are housed. It was, it's an incredible place. It was a great place to go with a fresh PhD. Um, but I went there, uh, and my husband stayed here with his job. So for four years, we commuted. We put in place a plan, and um, it worked out that I was offered a position here at MIT and came back. It's quite a bit different being a faculty member here than being a student. I think one of the big differences is the number of things you do. Maybe not how hard you work, but certainly the number of things. So as a student, uh, you take your classes, and then at some point you focus pretty much exclusively on your research. And usually it's one research project. Whereas a faculty member, you have multiple research projects, supervising multiple students, uh, teaching a subject a semester, maybe more. Uh, you're involved in committees. You're involved in a number of external activities, maybe like uh, with your professional community. You write proposals. So you have a lot of balls in the air at the same time. And so fundamentally, it's a different set of skills, I think, that you have to call into action to uh, manage your time effectively and, and be successful as a faculty member, um, where those sorts of skills, I think, aren't as critical as a student. As a student, you interact with your fellow students. 
and the faculty in your program, the faculty teaching your subjects. But that's kind of the extent of it, I think, for the most part, um, unless some students get involved in student government. A faculty member, I think you cast your net a bit broader. Um, you certainly are familiar with the faculty in your department or departments in which you interact. Uh, your department head, and maybe a little your dean. Being in the dean's office, that's one of the things I've really liked, is I now have met many more faculty from all different departments um, and just understand more the breadth of activities at MIT. Being in the dean's office, I've seen a lot more, and uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable. The thing that you hear from junior faculty uh, right up through the ranks is that it's hard to understand the scope of activity here, to know who's doing what where. Um, people who you can or should engage with because it could help you in your own research. So one of the things I've seen in the dean's office is that you know th there is this broader view of the kinds of activities going on. And if that vantage point could be shared by faculty, then I think it would help them a lot in just doing their job more effectively because they could make connections with other faculty that could lead to really interesting and exciting research. Uh, and I, I think that that's just one of the challenges um, here at MIT to, to connect with people who it would make sense for you to connect with. There's just so much opportunity here. Um, when I first started as an assistant professor, my focus primarily was on developing algorithms. So here's a mathematical model. Figure out a way to harness the computer's power and uh, solve this mathematical model for transportation problems where maybe there are billions and billions of possible decisions that can be taken. Figure out how you can get today or then computing power to solve the problems. So I, I worked a lot on that and, and working just working to find a way to try to address these really large-scale problems with the, the optimization theory and computing power that we had. And um, I think that that first step kind of morphed into a second step. Instead of trying to solve given problems, uh, we moved to figuring out how to mathematically state the problem. So what, what I found was that when you take as given a particular problem statement, then somebody else has decided what's important and what it is you're trying to do, what it is, what are your goals in trying to come up with a solution to the problem. But because of limitations in computing power, the decisions made aren't necessarily what I would consider and others to con would consider to be the right ones. So, for example, um, maybe what somebody was trying to do when they were um, figuring out how to assign their fleet of aircraft to the flights in the airline schedule, they wanted to maximize profit. But when you look at the, the kind of old models of that problem, they don't take into consideration things like things go wrong. There's bad weather that upsets the schedules and imposes delays and then disrupts passengers who are left at the airport or elsewhere for hours on end. And so my research turned more to thinking about what are the components of the problem we want to capture and what are our objectives. And then given that, how do we write this mathematically so that we can use our algorithms, our computers, to solve those problems. So it's in some ways combining 
um, the representation of the problem with an understanding of what's solvable in trying to advance our capabilities to, to build solutions that are good, in some sense, um, for these complex problems. And then I think um, that trend kind of just continued. So um, I think if, you, if I look at what I, how my research has changed, I think that I've begun to focus more and more on issues of, um, well, I guess, societal issues. So it might be uh, congestion in our transportation system and the uh, issues that congestion causes in terms of delays and pollution and energy consumption. And now, can we reposition how we think about designing and operating these transportation systems with these other objectives in mind that have to do with, in, you know, <laughs> not further harming the environment or even improving it, um, with issues in mind of like energy and the, the experience of the traveling public or the passenger. When I worked on algorithms, I was, um, I was really excited about the algorithms we were able to develop that allowed us to solve problems with, as I said, many, many billions of decision variables. Um, and to say something about uh, how close to optimal these solutions were. And then I think as I moved to more working on modeling, um, I, I think that I'm proud of the work where we put we put a different focus on things. So for example, you know, I have a, a body of work that, that's actually ongoing that is passenger-centric. And thinking about how you balance the interests of the airlines, which of course you have to, um, they, th their interests have to be protected or they won't be there, um, with those of the passengers. And what's interesting is, it's not necessarily a lose for the airline, a win for the passengers. And so that's, um, that's part of the work that I've done that I've been excited about. And, and I think the work that we're just launching in, in um, Singapore now, it's a new project on future urban mobility. And this, I think, also is really exciting work. We have a team of about a dozen faculty from MIT who serve as principal investigators, together with uh, another large group, at least 20 faculty from Singapore and MIT involved in the project. And it's working to think about how do we meet these growing demands for mobility around the world uh, in a way that's sustainable. And there's, I think, really exciting opportunities here. One of the things I've liked best about this project is it is truly interdisciplinary. So we have faculty involved from Sloan School of Management, several engineering departments from uh, the School of Architecture and Planning, and they all come together with really different ways of thinking about the problem, very different areas of expertise. And the team, I think most of us on the team didn't know each other before the team was put together. So we have this great opportunity to interact with colleagues who we had before not known and to um, meld these different approaches. So, for example, take some of the advances in uh, mobile computing and communications, information technologies, together with the autonomous vehicle, electric vehicle, and optimization and control experts, and think about how we can put these pieces together to try to realize this future urban mobility system. I think we're going to be getting around differently than we get around today. 
and I think that's our biggest challenge with our future urban mobility work. What we have to do is much more than create new technologies and be more efficient in our operations of these transportation systems. What we have to do is change the behavior of people because we cannot have a system in which each person gets into their vehicle and each person goes where they have to go. Um, and we have to figure out a way where it's people want to take public transportation. People want to ride share. And so there's there, there are different approaches to this, and I focus on the want rather than must. You know, there are uh, strategies around um, sort of the stick strategies of, well, we can impose um, different prices, congestion pricing. We can not allow people to drive their car except every other day. There are lots of rules, regulations that could be put in place and, and might have to be put in place. But I, I, I have focused more on the flip side of it. How do we design a system where it's actually more convenient and economical for someone to use public mass transit than their own vehicle? So that's the kind of thing that we're working on. And, and as I said, it, it needs to bring together these different areas of expertise. I think it relies heavily on information, real-time information and communication. I think it relies heavily on a very dynamic, responsive transportation system that can, um, can adjust to the demands, the transportation mobility demands, in real time. And right now, we don't have that. Uh, so those are the kinds of things we're thinking about. So my responsibilities are um, around academic affairs. So that's to just delineate. There's also an associate dean for research. So that's Karen Gleason, and she's in, in charge of kind of all things research. So all things not research are what fall under me. Um, the really great thing that I found uh, in the last three years now in this job is there's been an effort when uh, Subra Suresh came in as the new dean three years ago. He launched a number of different strategic planning exercises, and I was involved in, I think, pretty much all of them, and it was really fun. So we looked at a number of different questions um, from things like um, dual faculty appointments to um, team teaching to sort of things that fall under this category of barriers. And the mandate really was to bring down the barriers. So where are there barriers to interdisciplinary, cross-unit interactions, whether in teaching or research, and how do we bring them down? So that's been one of the, the primary things on which I focused. Um, we also uh, looked at undergraduate education. And again, this was a really exciting and fun thing to do, I think. Um, the result is this, this new flexible undergraduate engineering degree that is modeled after um, 2A, the, the degree in uh, mechanical engineering. And it, it was a really interesting process involving a lot of faculty, um, pretty much all department heads in the School of Engineering, thinking about uh, how we meet the future needs, education needs for engineers. And uh, the result was the flexible degree. And uh, that was um, a really fun process to go through and I think an important step that was taken. Um, and I think it'll, it'll be something that serves our students really well 
because it provides our students with the option to follow their passions. It gives them enough flexibility, um, I hope, we all hope, so that they can uh, take the sets of classes that best serve their interests um, and at the same time continues to provide MIT's you know, rigor and depth of experience in, in the engineering classrooms. What we found was that Course 2A, which is a degree that has actually been around for decades, but has been accredited for only about 10 years. Once accredited, what, what Course 2 found was that the 2A degree uh, steadily increased in terms of its enrollment. So much so that, if I remember correctly, something on the order of 40% of the incoming sophomores into mechanical engineering last year chose 2A as their degree option. And why they chose it, I think, is because there are some students who, rather than wanting to be an aeronautical engineer or a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer, instead perhaps want to have an impact on energy or on uh, development uh, in developing countries or um, transportation. So once you pick a problem area, now to best meet your needs, you, you really should draw from the Institute, not just even the School of Engineering. You should draw from the Institute and its set of course offerings to help you be best positioned uh, in that area. And so that's what the flexible degree is aimed at helping us to do. The idea is that at the core, you have the depth and rigor you would find in the core of any one of our traditional degrees. However, what's different is that there's flexibility provided for the rest of the degree, much of the rest of the degree, allowing um, the students to identify these interdisciplinary areas and take subjects um, across disciplines in that area. So a lot of times these area, areas are motivated by important societal problems and it, it reflects how our students, and I think students in general, are interested in making a difference and in, in, and in addressing these really complicated, hard societal problems. Now sometimes the interdisciplinary topics are actually maybe something different, like computational engineering that cuts again across disciplines but, but isn't specifically aimed at solving some societal problem, perhaps. So we have a mix of students um, who are interested in, in this degree, and we expect that it will be um, increasingly popular as students learn about it and understand that they can still have the MIT rigor and depth, but uh, as well the flexibility. So right now we have a mechanical engineering and aero and astro offering this degree. And we expect uh, additional departments over the next few years to bring that degree online as well. In my role as associate dean, chair something called the Faculty Search Chairs Committee. So the idea is to bring the chairs of all the faculty searches uh, together and share best practices around recruitment, well, identification of women and minorities who can apply for our open faculty positions, and then uh, trying to successfully um, identify MIT caliber women and minority faculty and bring them here. So I, in that way, yes, it's um, certainly an issue I spend time on. In terms of my personal experience, uh, it's been really interesting. I feel that I've been on the cusp of change. 
So when I started at Georgia Tech, I um, attended women faculty meetings that they had for their School of Engineering. And it was interesting because essentially those women faculty meetings were about uh, all the issues and justices that the women faculty were facing. Um, when I came to MIT, I also participated here in women faculty meetings, and I was really struck by how different the women faculty meetings were. Uh, it wasn't about complaining. It was about identifying what we wanted to do and doing it. And there was this attitude that whatever we want to do, we'll get support in doing. All we need to do is identify what it is we want to do, how we're going to do it, why it's important, tell the dean or the provost or the president, and we'd get support. So that was really refreshing to me because at Georgia Tech, I couldn't honestly identify with the issues the women were raising. And here what I, I find that I think some of the, the women more senior to me who have been here longer face something quite different from what I faced. I think when I came, I have found truly um, support. I, I can't point to an, a gender-related issue. I remember when I first started here that I was sometimes surprised because I remember once I was standing in line at a faculty meeting getting my lunch and um, one of the very senior faculty um, was behind me and he started talking to me about how do you, you know, how are you doing with balancing work with, I had, when I started here I had a newborn um, with your child or, and you know, how are you finding, he asked me all sorts of questions like, um, what do you do with this? Aren't you kind of tired? And I was just surprised that he was, it seemed relating to my life because he, he was very senior and I thought surely he's not experiencing the same thing and probably didn't experience it. And then he said, yeah, you know, I have a daughter your age and she's a professional and she has a young child and it's really hard. And so what I found was that many of the senior faculty were some of the most sympathetic and supportive because they, they were, they could relate. It turns out they could relate because they were seeing it through the lives of their children, but nonetheless, they understood. So that was interesting. And I get asked this a lot by my students, by junior faculty. It is, it's impossible to give advice of what is the right thing to do. I think uh, probably most of us always feel you don't quite right, have quite right the balance. But, you know, I found that that's true with everyone. When I talk to my friends who are stay-at-home moms or working part-time, it, it's very hard to find the right balance no matter what you're doing. There are only so many hours in the day. And so, you know, there are certain, I think, strategies that have worked for me uh, that help. And partly, I think, the strategy, one strategy that has helped me a lot is to be as disciplined about family time and leisure time as about work time. So, you know, I, when my, our kids were younger, um, they ski raced. So that mean, meant we would go to Vermont every weekend for our ski races. And I remember at one point saying to my husband, this leisure is going to kill me. Because being away all weekend, no laundry gets done, no grocery shopping. We had a wonderful time, though, skiing, and that will always be part of our family experience. But, it, you know, I, I had to say, oh, no, the weekend we are going skiing, and I'm not doing some of the other things that certainly probably could have been done or should have been done. The goals that I've, I've 
been working on or the goals I'll continue to work on. So they're, they're about figuring out how we ensure that this interdisciplinary activity uh, can thrive here at MIT. And I think there's still work to be done, especially on the education side with that. Um, I'm, I'm also interested in, in this topic we've been discussing. You know, I think that being a faculty member, um, it's, it, I, I think it gets harder and harder in some ways. You know, the, um, the bar just goes up and up. The expectations are ever increasing. And so I think making sure that faculty, women, men, uh, can have a life and succeed at MIT, it's, it's something to think about. What we, We've talked about flexibility for our students and providing that to them. How, you know, I think we have to think about that for our faculty too, to ensure that, that we get the most creative, the most enthusiastic and brilliant people here, because it's a great job to have, rather than it's a job that a few people can manage because it matches their lifestyle. A big difficulty are it's the numbers, little small numbers of people, um, women and minorities who um, are MIT caliber. And from that small pool, there's intense, intense competition for them. Uh, so th that's part of the issue. And I think we've done some pretty creative things to help us in that uh, arena. So uh, we've been tried to be very proactive to identify these people. And then we've also tried to be very flexible from the, from the dean side of it in terms of uh, having slots available from the deans, from the provosts, from the president's side, having slots available when such people are identified, even if they don't match exactly the area of the current search. So th that strategy, I think, has been very effective. But I think there are more ideas and more work to be done, surely. I think that was started when my second daughter was born. And uh, so it was the collection of my students in my research group, as well as some additional students who were interested in the research. And what we would do is get together uh, regularly and share research talks. And we would, we would discuss what project we were working on, what challenge we were facing, uh, what new approach worked or didn't work. We would just share uh, with each other and what we were working on and, and get advice and experience um, from the members of the group. And why I, 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 what I remember about this group and its formation was because my daughter had just been born, um, I wasn't coming into MIT every day for the day. So I said, how about if the group comes to me? And we met in my dining room, and I remember we had cappuccinos and muffins, and um, the students all came out to my house weekly for a while. And I think it, I, I loved it. My kids, I think, um, baby had no idea what was going on, but my older daughter thought it was kind of interesting having all these um, students around. And I think it was a good break for my students to get away from MIT and, and spend a little bit of time uh, out at my house. As co-director for the Center for Transportation and Logistics, I shared the job with uh, Yossi Sheffi, who was the other co-director. And my focus was primarily on the education side of things. So um, the Center for Transportation and Logistics was affiliated with two graduate degrees, a Master of Science in Transportation and a PhD in Transportation. Now they have another degree, a uh, Master's uh, in Logistics. But at that time there were two degrees and they were interdisciplinary degrees. So from the start, I have been involved 
and maybe what is um, somewhat atypical here, but increasingly common, and that is degrees that have they don't have a particular department as their home. They are um, standalone degrees that draw on subjects and faculty from many different departments across the institute. So I worked on um, curriculum design development for the, we did a revamp of the Master of Science in Transportation. And I also worked on uh, sort of strategy for the PhD in transportation. Ah, it's a lot of fun. The students are, well, they're brilliant. And they're uh, usually pretty open and vocal and interactive, so it's always a lot of fun uh, to teach MIT students. I, I, I think every time I teach um, a class, I'm amazed by some of the comments or questions that come because they just reflect how quickly our students absorb things and how smart they are. The Operations Research Center for me is kind of home because it is um, the center that is responsible for the master's and PhD in operations research. And uh, it is the center that brings together the faculty across the institute who do operations research. And it's, um, it, it's always been a really special place for me, both as a student and as a faculty member. The um, students are amazing and the faculty are great to work with. So I, I've really enjoyed um, being affiliated with the center and also serving as co-director. Collaboration interdisciplinary activities are really on two fronts, both in research and in education. So the, the premise of these centers, um, both CTL, Center for Transportation and Logistics, and the Operations Research Center. These are degree granting uh, units uh, and they are interdepartmental degrees. So the idea is that students graduating from these, getting these degrees, um, by their very nature, are taking subjects that span different disciplines. And, you know, I think that the the fact that we've organized operations research and transportation in this way at MIT has been a huge strength for us. So when we compete for students, we compete with top-rate programs. But we have an edge, I think, in that we're structured in the way we are. We're structured recognizing that these are interdepartmental, interdisciplinary programs. So a student coming in to say operations research, if they happen to have an interest in data mining for cancer research, the operations research center can meet that interest. Because our faculty, our affiliated faculty, it's a dynamic group. If we need someone with expertise in data mining or expertise in biology, we have the institute to draw from. Whereas other programs at other universities, they're departmentally based. And the set of faculty affiliated with a department is much less fluid and dynamic. So. Interdisciplinary is kind of the hallmark of, of these educational programs, but, but also the research, because all of our students are doing theses. And so their research, again, draws from faculty from across the institute. So that was launched about 15 months ago, and I serve as the director. Um, it is... Um, part of 
Well, it's related to a lot of the things that we were doing in the school in terms of bringing down the barriers, in terms of providing uh, interdisciplinary education and research in an important societal problem, that of mobility uh, and transportation. And uh, what we're trying to do there is really to leverage what we have at MIT to bring together uh, people with expertise relevant to transportation and try to make a difference. So for me, interesting, um, interestingly, we did a survey now about well, a couple years ago asking the faculty here at MIT, uh, do you do research that is relevant to transportation? And in response to that survey, we identified nearly 250 MIT faculty who said their work was either directly associated with or relevant to transportation. That was amazing. I, you know, I, I've been affiliated with transportation here at MIT the, the entire time I've been here. I had no idea that we would have such a response. And I didn't know most of the people. And so what we learned from that was we've really not done a good job of taking what we have here at MIT and bringing these people together to address the problem. And so that was kind of our initial uh, job to do, yes, is bring this community together um, and begin to focus these energy, this research uh, group and these energies on sustainable transportation. Well, it's, that's a, an interesting question because it's something that we are grappling with now. Um, I, as I said earlier, our team uh, in Singapore, on the Singapore project, is a multidisciplinary team where there are faculty who work on technology, faculty who work on vehicles, faculty who work on optimization systems, faculty who work on public policy. And what's interesting when you bring these faculty together, not surprisingly, we all speak different, a different language. And we in some ways have different value systems too. So that is part of the challenge. And what I think we all recognize is to affect change, we need all those elements that technology alone won't do it. Um, and policy alone, without having some way to inform policy, isn't useful either. So that's part of what we're working to do. Um, we had a meeting yesterday, actually. And what we were talking about was we would like to be the first university that comes to mind when Congress is debating some transportation policy issue with 250 faculty members having expertise on some element, we'd like to be there saying, this is what we have learned. This would be the consequence of doing that. Well, this, that would be the consequence of doing this. So we would like to be the ones that are part of the debate that provide information. And I think that, that that's a critical link to, to moving from developing things in our lab, testing them out, assessing them in our laboratory versus having it be used in practice and be adopted or transformed into new transportation policy at a national scale. Part of what we needed to do is first make it clear to our Washington office we are interested in being a resource because many faculty at MIT aren't interested in that particular as aspect, but certainly 
in transportation, there are a number of us who are interested in that. So sharing first just with our MIT people, we have this expertise and this interest in these sets of um, analyses that could affect and impact and inform policy. I think that is a critical first step. And so we've taken that, we're beginning that process now. Um, but I think there's also, I'm not sure if it's something that's changing. Um, I kind of suspect it is. But what, I, what we clearly see now and hear now when we have groups of us meet and talk about what it is we're trying to accomplish, many, many researchers are motivated by making a change, making a difference, having an impact. Uh, so I think the combination of that motivation and interest on the part of our faculty together with getting that information to the people who need that information. I think once the information is there and we have the opportunity, more opportunities to uh, showcase our analyses, then we'll find we're called a lot. Um, you know, certainly already this goes on, but I think we'd like to see it at a much larger scale. So. Um, this is a really different project for me out of the mainstream, but I guess it reflects optimization and operations research. It's really a methodology that can be applied in many, many, many different domains. So this is an effort, a project, with um, Professor Dimitri Bertsimas. He and I were co-directors of the OR Center uh, up until January, and, and he continues to co-direct the center. Uh, he's a faculty member in Sloan and an operations researcher. So what we are doing um, is building on some work that he has done uh, related to different drug regimens for the treatment of cancer. And so we have worked to build a database of the different drug regimens that have been used for different types of cancers and uh, recorded uh, different statistics like um, the toxicity, uh, which is like a proxy for quality of life, and um, the longevity, how long people survive uh, under the different drug treatments. And in this database that we have amassed, we then apply these data mining techniques that are optimization based. So we use our optimization background to try to mine the data to get some insights about effectiveness of these treatments. Because our goal is to figure out, how, is to recommend which drugs should be combined for future treatments. Now, this is a really different approach than a biologist would take, because it really isn't about modeling the biology. It's about looking historically at uh, drug treatments and their effectiveness, and trying to glean from that experience uh, information that would be useful for future drug treatments. Um, so that's ongoing work that uh, we have, worked. I mean, unfortunately at this point the results we have are in some ways negative results. And what they show is that we should have known before conducting the study that the drug treatment wouldn't be more effective than you know, the average treatment. It's very important to look at drug combinations because um, you can't predict the effectiveness of a combination of drugs by looking at each drug individually and somehow adding together the individual effectiveness. And so because uh, there is this combinatorial nature, there are many, many, many different ways you can combine these drugs for future drug tests. And so we're trying to use the historical data to inform that process of designing the future drug combinations. 
Well, that committee has already issued its report. And so it, essentially it was looking to um, understand the policies, the procedures, processes uh, f for the tenure process in different departments, different schools. And what we learned was there's a pretty high degree of variability. And so the, the notion then was to look at what are the effective practices, the best practices, and to catalog these um, as recommendations for the president and provost uh, as they think about uh, structuring these processes more institute-wide. One thing that's interesting is that different disciplines are really different. And so the processes uh, and the tenure process are just different and, and should be, I guess. So the metrics by which you evaluate faculty, different. Um, now, some of the things that we saw, though, that maybe don't have to be different, even though there should be differences. Some of the things we identified were um, in terms of how we go about selecting letter writers for cases, for example. Um, what input does the faculty member who's being evaluated have? Um, what is the process by which other names are identified? And why this is important is because uh, the letters received for a tenure case are really carefully considered and can make a huge difference. So careful selection of letter writers is really important. And so there are or different processes for doing that. And, um, and the best practices were um, compiled and used as sort of a guideline of how all the different departments might want to do it. Yeah, and there are different processes in terms of tenure committees, too. So some departments have all senior faculty involved in the process. Others have smaller promotion and tenure or executive committees. And so we, we examined these different practices. And in some cases, different practices were the right thing to do. And uh, it seemed, and in other cases, maybe a more uh, common or uniform approach seemed more appropriate. Well, I guess it's a combination of things that create this uniqueness. Uh, so necessary elements would be the really smart students and really smart faculty. So those are necessary. Uh, I think. Another really important element is back to the barriers, a um, point raised er earlier. I think that MIT has done a, a tremendous job at allowing um, interactions, research interactions in particular, across disciplines. Very, um, very fluid boundaries. Uh, along the research front. And I think the ability to respond quite rapidly to opportunities. And in part, that's because there aren't barriers. And in part, it's because of the type of people who are here. They're excited about uh, opportunities. And they identify these opportunities maybe more quickly than, than others. Um, I have to say, though, I think that it, it's getting harder and harder to distinguish ourselves. I think that we have to continue to work really hard to maintain our position. Other universities um, have gotten also very good at these things. And so I think we, we have to continue to innovate and continue to find ways to distinguish ourselves, to remain unique, and, and to be, you know, preeminent as we are. I'll give you one model, because I, I think probably there are different, different 
attributes of people that can combine to, to create success. Um, I ha but I think some of the necessary elements are a passion for your research, a passion to innovate, to discover. Um, I think that you have to be hardworking. And in my case, I feel that um, organization, sort of discipline, was really critical. I'm not sure it's necessary for everybody to be organized and disciplined, but for me, it was a, a critical factor, I think. Otherwise, it could have been too stressful, too overwhelming. But I think being structured and organized um, worked for me. I think um, another element that was, I think, important for me is really enjoying collaboration. Uh, for me, that collaboration, first, you learn a lot from it because you learn from others. Secondly, I think. I was more productive because I had more things going on when you have uh, many collaborators than certainly you would have if you were alone. Um, I think, you know, going back to the first thing, a passion for what you're doing, loving what you're doing is a hallmark of MIT faculty. And I think makes a really big difference in our ability to um, to accomplish things. You know, everybody says it doesn't matter, but in the end, I suppose it does. And that is, if you look at the ratings of the departments in the School of Engineering, many are top ranked. And I think collectively, well, certainly school collectively is top ranked. Um, and I think collectively, the School of Engineering faculty are just, um, at this moment, without peer. And that is the big strength. We have, tr again, tremendous faculty and tremendous students. Um, I think that what keeps us there is this constant um, innovation and sort of redefinition of what departments do. So uh, when I first sat an engineering council as the associate dean, the very first time I was involved in the promotion process. So we have our case book of uh, cases for faculty who are being considered for promotion. And associated with each faculty is their CV and letters of reference and lots of information, research papers. I was absolutely first amazed by the fascinating and exciting things people were doing. And secondly, I was really struck by the fact that if I covered the department name on the title page for a candidate, in many cases, I would not have guessed right about which, in which department they were housed. So that, I think, is one of the things that is really exciting about MIT. You know, once you're here, you are given the freedom to do whatever is of interest and exciting to you. And as a result, faculty are doing really cutting edge work, but it doesn't necessarily fall within the boundaries of what you would think computer science or mechanical engineering or electrical engineering or civil engineering, how we maybe have traditionally defined it. And so, you know, I think this interdisciplinarity and uh, this dynamic adapting of, of what we are 
is what has kept us where we are. Bill Mitchell was, I, I actually met him for the first time when we were beginning to form the proposal for the, the Singapore project. And he was, um, he came with this idea of the city car and a mobility on demand concept that was about the, the traveler, the passenger. It's thinking about what makes it easier for people to get around, but at the same time uh, is, fits with future urban systems and the tremendous demands that will be placed on them. And he had this vision of which he was totally passionate. And it, it was really fun to talk to him because although I know nothing about folding cars, the vision he had uh, was one that was easily understood and it was really clear to me where as an optimizer, my skills could play a role in designing the system. And I think uh, that was one of the, the real strengths of Bill. When he talked to me or he talked to my colleague in autonomous vehicles or my colleagues in network computing and control and described his vision, they saw where they had a place to, to fit and how they could impact that system and improve it. And and he was, he was just really great at painting this vision that was um, compelling and easy to understand. And uh, it's, uh, it's very sad that he won't be here to see the vision through. But he has a number of postdocs and students who have worked with him who are committed to this vision. And um, we continue to work with them. So one of the things that has changed is there are more women now, not everywhere, but more women now in many departments um, than there were when I started. So for example, um, when I began, I was the only woman in the Operations Research Center on the faculty. And now there's a handful of us. Um, when I began in civil and environmental engineering, I think we had the same number of women that we had a couple of years ago. It's improved in the last couple of years. But I think that what it points out is that although there are tremendous efforts uh, to increase diversity here, it is a really hard problem. And we, we, we have advances and successes, but it's also kind of easy to lose ground. And so it's just something I think will be an ongoing struggle. Um, other things that I think have changed somewhat. Again, were already evident when I came here, but I think have increased, is in civil and environmental engineering, we have, when I started, I guess at that time there was one biologist who was part of the civil and environmental engineering faculty, Penny Chisholm. And I think, uh, because she said it, she felt like she was sort of a, a fish out of water. Um, but she knew that she, that she fit there, but she was uh, uh, she was not typical. Uh, she didn't have the typical profile of a civil and environmental engineering faculty member. Now, there are a group of faculty um, who share her background, her expertise, and uh, with whom she collaborates in civil and environmental engineering, chemists and biologists. Um, material scientists. So the backgrounds of the faculty in civil and environmental engineering are very diverse, but the, the commonality is the, the domain and the problems on which they work. So again, I think, you know, I'm reminded when we were doing a search for 
uh, department head in civil and environmental engineering. And this was now whew, probably eight years ago. Uh, there was a firm that was brought in to help with the search. And they were, I was one of the members of the committee, and they were asking us, okay, so what is it you're looking for? And I think that this was something new for the person who had conducted, helped conduct searches in many other universities. We don't do, we don't make those kinds of distinctions. And, and, and I see it in my job as associate dean, because um, being sort of in a position of seeing every search uh, because of my role in trying to increase diversity, I was really surprised a few years back when I first saw the data and realized that multiple searches in multiple departments uh, in the school and even outside of the school were interviewing the same people. So one person might be interviewed by mechanical engineering, same person interviewed by aero and astro engineering, and maybe even by material science. And so it, it, it really does show that these departmental boundaries are really blurry. And so I think departments play an important role, but maybe not the role we, we maybe thought 50 years ago. Because they play a role, but they really, part of their role is to ensure visibility into the other departments about the activities going on there so that we can share teaching when it makes sense, we can collaborate and research when it makes sense. So it's interesting. It's a, it's a, a function, a structure that we need, I guess. Um, certainly we're not going to get rid of real quickly. Um, but we've, we've adapted it so that it is adaptable and allows this kind of flexibility. One challenge that I think is important for, in my mind, for MIT, um, it's, it's going back to what I think we started with um, the new flexible degree. At MIT, we train, so I have, it, of course, the engineering perspective. We train superb engineers. And, and I said that what we see with students today is an interest in making a difference. Um, and I think that we can do, we MIT, can do a better job at helping, helping students make a difference. And I think we have to think some about what are the skills that our students will need to to actually be in positions to make a difference. And, you know, certainly our students make a difference now. They go on and they do great things. But I think that, um, I think that we could do more to facilitate that, uh, even at the undergraduate level. And so I think we have to think about that. As a first step, giving them more flexibility uh, in their degree is a really important first step. Um, you know, we've talked about things like leadership and what, what should we do, what do we do, what can we do uh, to help develop future leaders, MIT grads as future leaders. We've talked about uh, the whole idea of the global economy and the role of an MIT engineer in this global world. And should they have more exposure, more international experiences? And so there are, there are a host of different uh, questions like that.